The idea behind the after render phases is um, born out of, of kind of common performance problems that we see in Angular applications. And I guarantee you, if you have an application like any, anything larger than a trivial app, right, and someone has not looked at performance there, you will probably be able to find instances in the application where you do something called a reflow. Basically, like, um, signals are states. So, like, um, if you're trying to track some stuff or activity using a state, so you have to try signals. But if you want to do some event-based stuff, then RxJS is the way to go. That's basically why I understand from Mars. And um, regarding snack bar, I have no preference if it's an event or a state. Like, I really have no reference. I, I have no preference. But I did it with a state. So if there is a data, that means there, there's, there, there's a, that's a state, then fire the snack bar. That's why I used uh, after render effect with the signals regarding that. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's basically it. And, props and, and to my Lars, question been actually really to, big, to, helpful. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent to Lars. Yeah, and and but my question actually to Alex, like uh, after render effect, it takes four, um, uh, takes four uh, variables. I don't know how we call this. Yeah, it takes four fun overload functions with with four methods, which is read, write, read and write, mix, and th there's a fourth one. Yeah. Um, when to use? Because because I used all of them and the code still works. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I think like that. That's the astute observation. Like any of them will will like function, right? Um, the idea behind the after render phases is um, born out of of kind of common performance problems that we see in Angular applications. And I guarantee you, if you have an application like any anything larger than a trivial app, right? And someone has not looked at performance there, you will probably be able to find instances in the application where you do something called a reflow. And so a reflow being like you somehow in, in operations you do against the DOM cause the browser to say, well, you've messed up all the CSS and now I have to like figure out what the whole page should look like again. Um, and so a common example of this is like you change a CSS class, right? Um, so something toggles from like inactive to active, and then you ask the browser to like, you know, get the offset top of an element or get the scroll position or something like that. When you ask the browser that question, it says, well, I don't know because my previous state got invalidated when you changed the CSS classes. So I have to go and figure out where everything should be on the page again. That's called a reflow. And the ideal scenario is you make all of your DOM mutations, you do one reflow, and then the browser gets to like display that to the user, what we call painting. What we see in a lot of Angular applications is somewhere in a lifecycle hook, like ng after view checked, or um, you know, in response to like a query setter or something like that, people call you know offset top or get style or you know get computed style or things like that. You ask the DOM a question. And they're doing it inside one component or one directive. But what that means is you do some DOM changes, some updates, then you ask the browser this question. It says, oh, you know, I have to go and recompute the, the page layout, reflow the page. It gives you an answer. And then the next component comes along and says, well, I also have to change the CSS class. So it does that. And then you ask the browser the same question. Right for a different element, um, and then the browser says, "Well, I got to re recompute everything again because you invalidated the last time I did it." Um, and so this happens four or five times, and you end up with a very expensive change detection operation because you've kind of interleaved reading from the DOM, right, asking it questions about the rendered result with making more updates. So reflows are a major source of kind of performance problems in applications where no one is paying attention to this stuff. Um, and so what we we sat down to do was kind of come up with an API that would guide you into doing the right thing and allow Angular to optimize for like, you just tell us what work you have to do and kind of what you're trying to do, right, by your intention. And we will figure out for you the right ordering of these operations to not trigger so many reflows. 
And so the after render API has kind of two different shapes for this. Um, it has the the kind of I just want to use after render and I don't want to think about it and like please stop you know bugging me about performance. Um, that kind of just call after render with a callback. And in that case, we were basically saying, okay, fine. We'll do all the DOM updates of change detection, then we'll call your after render hooks. And like, if you reflow a few times, you know, that's better than before um, when it was interleaved with the DOM updates. But we have the kind of more um, expressive API for after render where you can actually tell us um, the operation that I want to do is to read from the DOM, right? So we give you a read hook. And we give you a write hook if you're saying the operation I want to do is to actually do a DOM mutation. So for whatever reason, you know, maybe it's canvas element or something, I want to do some painting, I want to do some updates that's outside of the normal change detection flow, but I'm going to tell Angular I want to write in this operation. And what that lets us do is even among all the after renders that need to run to say we can run the writes before the reads. And if we can run the writes before the reads, then we can avoid doing reflows because you don't do a reflow until you get to the reads. And so those phases let you kind of organize the operations that are happening in after render so that Angular can better optimize them and make sure that all of the, the mutations happen before all of the reads need to happen. Um, there is the early read phase, which is useful when you want to do things like, you know, I need to read from the DOM so that I can go do a write later. So the way it runs is like early reads, then writes, then reads. And I think mixed is in there somewhere as well. I think mixed happens before writes. Um, so after render and after render effect have this option of you, you tell us kind of what your intention is, and then we better order the operations that are happening. But if you stick a DOM operation in any of the phases, it will work. It just might not be as efficient as it could be. Hmm. So, Go ahead, oh, you uh, think? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm going to ask. Uh, most of what you've said, I've understood. But then you called me yeah. up when you said, we're trying to do your write before the read, but the write depends on the read. So unless I'm missing some key information here like okay okay thanks yeah let, let, let's actually look at an example right so um like one kind of operation i might want to do in a write um is to say i want to like let's say focus this element right um that's kind of a dom mutation it doesn't have any impact on um you know it doesn't depend on like the results of any kind of reading operation so I have my like element, and I want to say after next render. Um, I could just do this, right? Like element dot focus. Um, but if I want to be slightly more efficient about it, I can tell Angular, okay, this is a write operation that I'm going to do, and I'm going to focus the element. Um, or I might say, you know, I want to take this element and like you know a end child of you know some child that I created that has nothing to do with reading from the DOM, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, but another common thing is like, maybe I want to size this element based on um, its position or something like that, um, where I actually have a dependency from the, um, the read side to the right side. Um, mm. So let's see, I just wanna make sure I get this right. Yeah. Um, so in that case, I can actually say, OK, I need to kind of read from the DOM to figure out where this element is, right? Let's say I want to get a scroll top. Um, so I could say read, right? And I want to like ask about the element scroll top. But remember, the reads happen um, after the writes. So if I try to do this in the read phase, it's kind of too late to use the result in the write phase. Um, so in that case, we have the early read phase where we can say, oh, I want to get the scroll top of this element. And then in the write phase, you actually get the like position, right? The result of early read. And now I can say, you know, element dot height equals, you know, position plus like a thousand pixels. I don't know. 
right? Makes sense. Some Makes kind sense. of operation there. Then would you say that uh, write and after read is the most rare use case? Because I still don't see how that can even happen. You know, you know. Like, I'm for example, early read and write. This makes sense to me. Like, okay, this yeah. makes. Sense. But like writing something and then reading something to do. What would be the purpose of reading that? that that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. Everything you've said so yeah. far is good, but the right. I, I think I've good. I've seen read used more commonly when you want to um, measure the DOM, and then not like feed that back into rendering, but like report it somehow. Um, so a lot of pay, you know operations um, in some Google applications care about giving um, like recording metrics or, or telemetry about like did was this element in view for example or you know like did the user scroll to this position um, and that's where you would use the read phase to like I want to ask the DOM a question but then instead of like writing back to the DOM with the answer I want to just like you know log the answer somewhere. Uh, so that the product manager who's looking at that app later in the future can say like, oh, I see that like users are actually interacting with this feature or they're getting to that page, that part of the page and scroll or something like that. Uh, okay. So read is when you, when you kind of care about the answer, but not for the purpose of rendering. Hmm. Nice, nice, okay, nice. So, so, so writing something to the DOM, um, so if I uh, let let me take my example of uh, the snack bar. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think, Alex? That's a read. That, that's a write, right? Um, I think um, you have to elaborate a bit more about the example. Which part of the snack bar? So, um, it's just a if you if you if you are it's just a signal inside based on the signal like it fires snack bar. But I put it in after render after render effect. Right. Maybe I can jump in because I, I've seen the code from Ali. Um, you used the read hook, um, but now that we know a lot more about the different phases, um, because you are displaying the snack bar, it's some kind of a write to the DOM. So you should use the write hook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems reasonable. So basically, okay. we've evolved even since this afternoon. Thank you, Alex. We learn new stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great questions, also, Ali. Thank you. And thank you, Alex. Of course. Thank you, Lars. And Abraham. It's very encouraging for us to see people out there interested in learning how to implement this properly because it really makes a big difference if you understand it and asking these questions to really kind of get into the details of like, I know kind of vaguely, but I really want to understand specifically is really valuable because then you guys can go out there and, and implement it properly with confidence. Very exciting. Yeah. I liked yeah. how you mentioned the problem of reflow and performance as a pretext to what you were about to explain next. That that's, that really helped me like, thank yeah. you. I, in other words, like, thank you. <laughs> oh, I can even put it here, right? You get, you get two reflows, right? Like, so before the after next render, right? Like Angular does writes. Um, then the after render hooks run and like you might do a reflow if you read from the DOM, then you do more writes. And then finally the browser does a reflow and then the final result is like browser paints the um, UI. Oh my! Right? Like we actually God. flush to the screen everything that we did, um, and so you get at most kind of two reflows. Um, two reflows won't hurt you. A hundred reflows will. Um, even like ten would be kind of excessive. So after the the phases of after next render allow you to do as few reflows as possible for the logic that you're trying to write. Nice, 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 nice. Dominic, sir. Uh, is is there like in Chrome? Is there something to measure reflows? Oh, the performance tab is great for that. Yes. Okay. It it will highlight for you um, in very bright colors when you are doing reflows in your UI. 
Uh, if you've never opened your application and recorded a performance trace for it, I highly recommend doing it. It's very insightful. Um, Pavel's been working on some really good integrations too with Angular giving kind of better results in the performance tab so you can see more clearly like what's actually going on. Interesting, thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess yeah. I'm gonna ask again. I'm not sure if you know the number, but like a general, you said that this is a common thing. So maybe you have like a common, let's say percentage, like how much did the performance improve by, let's say, insisting on using after next render? Is this even like, uh, mm -hmm. Is this too it's, hard? It's very situational. Yeah, it's hard to. Um, I was going to ask a similar yeah. question. Can you? I don't know if it's a, if you can, but I'm just curious. What is the most reflows that you've seen happening, like all at once? Oh, hundreds. Oh my god! Wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's like you need a couple things to line up for that, right? But I have seen before, like. You have an ng4 it's showing 100 rows in a table and every row of the table has a directive that's like reading from the dom right that's a recipe for 100 reflows right there um so you know the, the, these kinds of things are like it's not always going to be a problem but there can be scenarios where it absolutely is a problem but how you how do you tackle something like that um like like for one this is a really good example actually yeah so for one right like we're trying to build patterns into the framework where it's harder to get yourself into trouble here um this is absolutely also not an angular problem right reflows are kind of a, a web thing that can happen in any framework and it's you know the, something developers have to watch out for um so the 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 way we try to approach this is to have the developer experience around you shouldn't have to worry about it under normal circumstances if you're kind of structuring your code um, in a way where the framework can optimize it for you. So we're you know, trying to push you into I... this, like being just doing the right thing by habit.